Hello, everybody. I'm Jim Mundy, and I am the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation, and you are watching another episode of Mondays with Mundy. Drum roll. How's that? All right. Uh, one of the neat things about walking into the clubhouse, the league house on Broad Street or Sanson Street and 15th Street when it opens is that you can always find an exhibit of some size or another. So in Broad Street, ground floor, Hewer Room, wonderful exhibit on built up the Civil War in the Union League. First floor, vitrine. Second floor, another vitrine related to the Washington portrait by Sully. But if you walk down the second floor into the west end of the clubhouse, the 15th Street section, you go into the Lincoln Memorial Room. And inside there are these two splendid built-in vertical uh, display cases designed by Horace Trumbauer and his firm when they redesigned that room in 1917. So that's where we're headed. So you can walk down the second floor from Broad Street to 15th Street while I share my screen. And looks like this is going to work. Holy cow. Just, just for fun, this is the fifth time I tried this. <laughs> so, oh my. Uh, so here we are. Uh, Agnes Yarnell is like a lot of very important people in Philadelphia, seldom recognized in Philadelphia. But her family uh, on both sides go back to the 1600s in Pennsylvania. The Coxes, her mother was a Cox, came over to Pennsylvania in 1670 and the Yarnells came over in 1683. So. Wow, pretty neat stuff. So we're going to study Agnes Charnel because in those display cases in the Lincoln Memorial Room are this, is this wonderful exhibit of bronze sculptures. It's, they're part of a 42-piece collection that she did on the Civil War. And, um, and she explained to me one time, uh, she was looking through some photo albums of the Civil War and was just moved by these images of these soldiers and by civilians and things like that. And so she created this collection of sculptures. And that's what we're gonna take a look at today. But she was more than just a sculptor, she was a poet. And in 1987, she was claimed evocatrix extraordinary. So let's find out why. So this is the Lincoln Memorial Room. And we're looking at the east wall. And you can see on the two cases there, you can see some figures in there. And that's what we're looking at eventually. So here we are, another image of them side by side, a little close up if you can. And then now with the doors open, you get a better idea of what this exhibit looks like. And it was installed by our wonderful archivist, Keely Tulio. So shout out to Keely. All right, she does a great job with all these exhibits all around the house. So, so here's Agnes Arnold. She was born in Drifton, Pennsylvania, which is in Luzerne County, so she's upstate. And that's because the Cox family, her, her mother's family, when they came over in 1670, migrated upstate Pennsylvania and they eventually become large mine owners and operators. And so that's where her family was living when she was born in 1904. But uh, her father, Charlton Yarnell, uh, was a banker and came and they came back to Philadelphia within a few years because she spent the most of her life in Philadelphia and the Philadelphia suburbs. So, so uh, when she was just six years old, she was already in an art school called the Liberty Tad School of Modeling. And so it seems as if she was already predestined to be a sculptor, if you will. And she was not just a sculptor. She was also a painter, an art historian, and perhaps even where she got her, her penchant for poetry. Uh, she went to the Baldwin School in Bryn Mawr. That's where she got her formal, uh, I guess, academic education, if you will. And graduating from Baldwin, she then went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts on Broad Street in Center City. And there she studied under Charles Grafley. And you can see a lot of his work one of the, from the early 20th century, one of the more prominent sculptors working in the city itself. Uh, by the 1920s, she had opened up her own studio in Philadelphia, where she continued to study under such other Philadelphia sculptors as Boris Bly, uh, Charles Manship, and Alexander, oh, Parles, I'm sorry, it's Paul Manship, and Alexander Archipenko. So uh, she had her first exhibit and her first major exhibit in 1932 in New York City. And then in Philadelphia, throughout the 1930s and 40s, she would have four separate exhibits in Philadelphia itself, but at the Pennsylvania Academy. All right. And in that time period, she would also get married. She married Wynne Lawrence Lepage, who was an aeronautical engineer, 
but his specialty was helicopters. And if you remember going way back to one of the earliest episodes we did in the series, we did an episode on helicopters. Right. So, and uh, well, he was mentioning that, but nonetheless though, but and, uh, I think when she met him, when they married, at that point, he was the president of the Franklin Institute because when I first met him in 1978, he had a, he had a room at the league. Uh, and, a, and a very elegant man. He he was um, still the president of the Franklin Institute. So, so Agnes. All right. So that um, over the course of her career, uh, and it was a long one. I mean, she lived to, as you can see, she lived to, uh, to be eighty-five years old. Uh, she sculpted many famous, if not world famous, figures. For instance, uh, let's see. Let's start with. Oh, Edna St. Vincent Millay, all right, Judith Anderson, Carl Sandburg. Everybody knows Carl Sandburg. Uh, she did Franklin D. Roosevelt. She did Ronald Reagan. Uh, she did Pope Paul II. Uh, but from what I understand, she was most happy about or most proud of uh, three sculptors in particular George Washington and the Marquis de Lafayette in the Valley Forge Historical Society, and of course, her bust of Abraham Lincoln that is now at that is in the ownership of the Union League's, it's in the Union League's art collection, I should say. Thank you, Dope. All right. So um, let's take a look at some of her work. Naturally, this is the house. This is the house her father built in Center City, Philadelphia. Now, both of her grandparents, uh, paternal and maternal, were members of the League. Her paternal grandfather, Ellis Yarnell, was actually a founding member of the League. He signed the Articles of Association in January of 1863. So, and then her father was also a member of the League. So he was a member of the League when he built this house at 17th and Locust Streets in Center City, and it is still there. 35 rooms, uh, 33 rooms, 35,000 square feet, big house. But her father commissioned Violet Oakley to do murals all throughout the house. And I'm sure that this just reinforced Agnes's interest in art itself in general. And so this is just the foyer. And you can imagine, I mean, look at it. If, if it's not paneling or wainscoting, it has a mural on it. And Violet Oakley was just tremendous, one of the greatest muralists in Philadelphia, uh, working in the, in the first half of the 20th century. But you get some idea now of, of what it must have been like to live inside that house. Stunning. But then, but then, in 1980, she publishes this book, An Attempt at Evocation of the Civil War. All right. And we have copies in the library, and I encourage you to read them. And it is not just a catalog of this specific sculpture collection, but also there is a poem with each piece. And that's what makes it extraordinary, I think. And it makes her and Avocatrix extraordinary herself. So let's take a look. So here are two examples. Um, on the left, we have a black soldier, it's called guard duty because many of the soldiers in the United States color troop regiments during the Civil War did a lot of guard duty as well. On the right, it's called Sherman's Raider. So obviously someone who was part of William T. Sherman's March to the Sea in 1864 and 1865. On the left, obviously a wounded soldier called sick leave and on the right, carrying the dead. So obviously the results of battle. We have some Navy figures on the left, the hornpipe sailor. And the, and the hornpipe, by the way, was a musical piece played generally on a concertina or an accordion of some sort, if you will. And then the sailors would dance to it. On the right, the monkey boy, the, the powder boy, monkey boy, same thing, because these were the young lads who ran gunpowder to the cannons on the ship during a battle. And here we have civilians on the left, an elegant lady, obviously part of the plantation aristocracy, and then on the right, Mammy, obviously part of the slave population on those plantations. But wonderfully done. And here we have a, a horse that died in battle. Would you believe that between, depending on how you, if you include donkeys and mules, close to 3 million animals died during the Civil War alone, over a million horses. So obviously she saw photographs of dead horses in the battlefield and this is what she came up with. 
Hmm. This is called a tryst with death. Now, all the previous figures we've seen are uh, bronze. This is actually fiberglass. And the bronze figures are all vertical. This is actually horizontal. So it lays flat on the surface as if it was a body just lying on the ground. And, and it's incredibly evocative, I, I think. But as all of her pieces are, I am a big, big fan of her sculpting. Here we have, we're going to have about three pieces now that we'll focus in on specifically. And these are actually in the display cases in the Lincoln Memorial Room. And this is called the flag. I don't know if you can tell or not, but that flag is actually the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia, otherwise known as the Stars and Bars. So I hope you can read that. It's the flag I hold is the rebel's flag, proud mate wave and high at night. For my my comrades and I meant for it would gladly die. Jeez. But the etch richly, um, let's go to the last stanza. March for the rising tempers and the silver chivalry, for God and the right go with us in the Confederacy. Yep. So, all right. Now, obviously, um, we've moved on to a different image. Weep no, my lady. And as you can see, she's holding a sword. So, unfortunately, my little camera image of myself is blocking that first paragraph. So I will, or stanza. So I will let you read it. Oh, I can read the first line. Thou hast his sword who went to war. And on you go from there. I spirit him, yea. Now the days have run out since he had gone away. But I like the second to the bottom stanza. Oh, weep no more, my lady. Let suffering pass by. Hold him within thy heart of hearts, and he will never die. Hence the title of the piece. And our third piece, a slave. After all, this is why the war was fought. Slavery, right? Wow, such a, a powerful piece, I think. Still as a statue, mute as a rock, thou standest quiet on the block. And then let's go down again to the second to the last stanza. And surely glory waits for thee on some far day when thou art free. And surely when the angels call, the slaves will enter first of all. So it gives you some idea what she was thinking as well when she was not only sculpting, but also writing the poetry as it relates to the pieces in the collection itself. So just great stuff. And this is her bust of Abraham Lincoln that I am particularly fond of. And I know that her style of sculpting isn't everybody's favorite. Uh, when I was first learning art curating, if you will, I was told it was called the additive style because it's made of clay. And of course you add clay to create the figure that you're trying to create. So additive it is, but I love its roughness because you, you, you know, it's, it gives it more strength, I think more body and just more visualness all the way around. So I'm particularly fond of this particular piece. And you won't find it at the League House because it is at the Torsdale Golf Club Clubhouse. So when you walk in the entrance hall, right through the front door, and you turn to the right, it's against the far right wall. Because we've tried to put at least one uh, Lincoln image, whether it's a sculpture or painting, perhaps, in each of the Union League's properties. So this one is now up at Torsdale. And then here... We have April the 7th, 1987. And on the right, you see Robert M. Flood Jr., who then was vice president and chairman of the library committee, because back then the library committee was in charge of the art collection. They had a committee on art archives and history. And Mr. Flood was particularly keen on art and history. And I don't know how the connection was made with, with Agnes Yarnall, um, but it was made somehow. And the league agreed to purchase 42 piece bronze Civil War collection. And then she donated the bust of Abraham Lincoln. And we can see it on that pedestal or plinth behind her. And that was that. It was a great evening. And she was quite a lady. I remember shortly after this, uh, we started uh, thinking about doing oral histories. And she was our first one, believe it or not. But we actually videotaped it. So I went out to her house. And she lived in, um, well, Ardmore technically. Uh, but it's the English village right on Cherry Lane, or maybe it's actually technically Winwood now, but uh, back then it might have been Ardmore. 
And so it's right off the tree lane off of Montgomery Avenue. And we had lunch and it was quintessentially old Philadelphia. We had jellied consomme with lemon slices for the appetizer. We had tea sandwiches or finger sandwiches for lunch. And for dessert, we had Pepperidge Farm cookies and we had lemonade to drink. And it was just, I can still remember it after, you know, what, uh, 35, 40, you know, almost 40 years later. It's just what fun it was. Because she was really quite a lady. And I mean that with in every sense of that word. So, so Agnes Sharnel, next time you're in the League House, please go to the Lincoln Memorial Room. Look at the sculptures. And, and I, I think you won't be disappointed. And if you can, go to the library or to the Heritage Center. We have a copy of that book, The Revocation of the Civil War. Oh, and I forgot to mention, 1987, that same year, she also received a, uh, an award from the Women's International Association. And they proclaimed her the Avocatrix Extraordinary. So, and she was in a very good company. So there you go. So Agnes Sharon, everybody, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you get to know her better. So thanks for watching another episode of Mondays with Monday. It's been a great pleasure, especially to bring such wonderful aspects of the league and its history and its art collection to all of you. So we'll be back in two weeks. So in between, we have a uh, spring is almost here, almost. And daylight savings time to boot. So I'll see you in two weeks. In the meantime, stay well, stay healthy, and thanks for watching. Bye-bye.